So um, seeing all those channels and reminds me of how much the, your channels have changed, how you've evolved, mm -hmm. all of them. And you've attributed the success of the channels to staying close to the creative community. How has that changed as more of these SVOD players, Netflix, Amazon, are throwing tons of money at the creative community? Well, I think you know there are different businesses out there. So you know I, the evolution of our brands, um, I think, has been a necessity for the consumer. And you know the question is, do you put the consumer at the center, or do you put uh, distribution at the center, or do you put ad sales at the center? And I very much believe that you know you put the consumer at the center. Um, I think we're not afraid as an organization to recognize. Um, the need to evolve for future generations. Um, History Channel is probably the prime example of that. Lifetime is going through that now. Um, you know, the SVOD, as it pertains to SVOD, you know, those challenges are more singular in a show-by-show -show basis right. and than they are on a um, on a brand-to-brand -brand basis. Um, you know, most of the SVOD platforms are primarily scripted driven as they, in terms of how they relate to brands like ours right. versus the unscripted. Um, but I, I think, you know, brands will be critical and even more so as viewership patterns change, as delivery mechanisms change, as the models change, you know, being sort of prey and spray, mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very broad general entertainment will be difficult, I think, because consumers need a curator in a sea of such overwhelming volumes of content. Do you think we're moving, I mean, to follow on that, do you think we're moving back to niche content? I mean, before, <coughs> so many cable networks were aspiring to be broad, and now look what's happened with broadcast networks. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's finding that balance. You know, we, we certainly have been in a bit of an arms race over the last decade in mm -hmm. terms of trying to keep growing, and how do you how do you grow a brand that is fairly niche? And the impulse was to get broader. Right. I mean, that's just a sort of a consumer reaction. But I do believe, um, you know, absolutely that brands and becoming more focused will get more critical. You know, for us, we're spending a lot of time talking about the quality of the audience that we're driving, not necessarily just the quantity of the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, a really important through line um, for cable portfolios going forward. You know, we don't want our audience to be duplicated across our entire portfolio either. And then within the portfolio, we want to be able to say, you know, we have a higher propensity of purchasers of the Ford 150 than the next person right. because of the, qual the quality of the audience that's, um, you know, trusts the history brand or trusts the A&E brand. So as um, the quality of your audience becomes more important as something that you can tout to the advertising community, mm -hmm. does measurement become important, more important? And, and what, are, how, what are the challenges for, for you in this new measurement landscape that we're, we're dealing with? That, you know, I mean, there is no sort of standard for online viewership. No, I mean, you look, measurement is really a headache yeah. for all of us. Um, you know, the agencies have adopted Nielsen. You know, when we were, you know, pre all of these other platforms and, all, and viewership happening in different ways, at least we were all on the same questionable system. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we're a little all over the road. And, um, you know, a lot of my competitors aren't even reporting overnights. Right. Um, more and more. And more and more. I think, you know, that's a challenge internally. How do you motivate your teams? It was bad enough that we had to explain C3 to a bunch of programmers who just wanted to drive to overnight ratings. Um, but now it's, you know, when we aggregate the, the views, and you can't do it for weeks, which is archaic right. to think of. Yeah. You know, it takes us weeks to figure out how many views were, <laughs> you know, seven, day, uh, seven days after that were on VOD, that were on the tablets, and you put it all together. I mean, shows increase 100% mm -hmm. in their metrics. And yeah. so that gives me some hope that when we figure out who's going to own the platform for measurement, yeah. and I'm not sure if it'll be Nielsen, um, that you know, people are consuming content, and we can prove that. It's you know, for uh, just 
put on my reporter's hat on for a minute. It wasn't for, just on? It wasn't just on. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> what, um, the, the issue for us is we want to know how many people are watching so do I. Netflix shows, <laughs> right? Yeah. And Netflix claims they know, but they won't tell us. Yeah. So, I mean, what, do you have a, an opinion on that? Do you think it would be that, that there should be a little more transparency? You know, look, they're different. They're a different business model. They're not selling ads. And, you know, they're worried about churn. HBO mm -hmm. didn't used to report ratings either right. until everyone started playing in their sandbox and they had to prove they were better right. or they were as good. Um, you know, I think I'd like to know, too. You know, you can sort of speculate. I think the challenge for them will also come from the creative community. Yeah. If the creative community doesn't know how they're performing, it's very hard to renegotiate deals. It's very yeah. hard to figure out, you know, what your worth should be in that marketplace. Yeah. So I, I, my hunch is they'll get more pressure from the sellers and from the creators than they're going to get from the competitors. What do they care what I think? Right. Um, you know, they, they don't have to. There's no business imperative to, to, to reveal what their views are based on what A&E thinks or Viacom or Discovery. But if the creative community starts to really push on them, I think they'll be they'll yeah. they'll be under fire to at least figure out some sort of metric to provide the street. Well, that's that's where a lot of the numbers have leaked from mm -hmm. the creative because they do need to know to I mean, negotiate deals. We've all heard deals. Orange is the New Black was yeah. much bigger than House of Cards. Exactly, exactly. And what do your what do the numbers tell you? Your internal numbers <laughs> tell you in terms of. Where where is the white space um, for for streaming for you for your digital platforms? Is there white space? I don't. Know. I mean, the white space is a tricky question. I, I think, um, you know, we're we're really focused on, in terms of streaming, we are brand builders mm -hmm. and we're content creators and we do that well. Where can we do things that are? not associated necessarily with our current portfolio of brands, but are more tailored to a platform. Mm -hmm. You know, when um, Dance Moms is in premieres, we see a 60% authentication rate for lifetime. So clearly there's this 20-year-old or teenager out there yeah. that's finding content that they may or may not should be watching. Right. <laughs> um, and they're, they're, they're finding uses for it on the devices that they like. And so we're spending a lot of time looking at what products can we launch. Um, apropos to this weekend, Fifty Shades of Grey, for the women's in the room and the men in the room, is coming out. The reason that book took off had nothing to do with it being in a bookstore. It had to do with the privacy of the tablet and that women could read it and nobody knew what they were reading. Right. Um, the Lifetime movie is a little bit like that. And so we're looking at <laughs> subscription, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, it's very lucrative, actually. Um, so we're looking at you know subscription products that are tailored just around the Lifetime movie, yeah. and and maybe that's ways for us to engage with consumers and build new brands, um, you know, on different platforms. And you because you have much more information about who is. Consuming than you used to. Then the 18 to 49, not enough. the 25 to Not 40. enough. I mean, I think the holy grail will be the marriage of a traditional media company and a mega-sized digital company. And that, you know, if we can figure out how to move that audience around, and, you know, that's that's what I'm out beating the drum around. Mm -hmm. If I had the, the data of a, if I say something, everyone's going to think that's who we're talking to. But... If I had the data of a big digital content company married with the platform and the marketing ability of what we can do, and we really could figure out how to work together in that ecosystem, you know, I think that's a value. Brand has always been um, so important to the consumer and so mm -hmm. important in any kind of content creation business. And I think you can't not look at some of the digital brands today. And there are very few true digital brands. Yeah and think that that's the cable 25 years from now. I mean, probably everybody in this room would name the same 10 cable channels that they wish they had started. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I look at the digital brand space. Is there somebody or a company that's navigating this, this space well? Is there like a role model for this? 
new technology. Well, of course, Frank. Frank. <laughs> Frank is <laughs> Besides Frank. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's hard to lump us all in that same bucket because we're in different businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, Amazon is in the shipping business, let's be clear, and um, with very different margins. And, you know, Netflix is in an SVOD. And, we're in advertising and, and subscription, mm -hmm. but dual and broadcast is yet even different from that. So we have to navigate these waters given the parameters of our own challenges mm -hmm. um, and not get too distracted with, look what Netflix is doing, look what Netflix is doing. Well, you know, they have their problems and I've got my problems and they're not necessarily the same. Um, you know, distribution has been the holy grail for a long time, but it's not really the distinguishing factor anymore because you can find distribution in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, speaking of digital players, you negotiated the company's uh, stake in Vice. Mm -hmm. um, what's that relationship about? Where do you think Vice and A&E can work together? And then I have a follow-up for you. I mean, I, I think it's a passive relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, obviously yeah. a 10% stake does not buy you operating control of a company. Um, <laughs> as much as I tried to negotiate for that, it, it didn't go well with Shane. Um, you know, we want to learn from them. Yeah. They are, you know, we saw, I saw the consolidation of the production companies sort of happening and these astronomical prices that were being paid for companies that we work with that don't own any of their content. You know, we've been looking at studios that sort of put themselves on the market, take themselves off the market, we looked at agencies. And then in Vice, I saw all of it in one. I saw a studio. I saw a content creator. I saw an agency. I saw a distributor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to learn from them. And they're talking to a generation that, you know, we're struggling to connect to. And I say the we as the royal we, yeah. I think, as an industry. Um, some people like to think that, well, they just don't watch television. I would counter that we also don't give them a lot of good television. Really? I mean, because, I mean, that's one of the narratives now that there is a well, plethora now, of plethora. good television, but, but I think in it's that hard to find. in that sort of bold voice, it's mm -hmm. they don't have as much as, you know, the 45-year-old woman has. That's true. That's true. But do you think, I mean, the, the, there's a narrative among analysts that Vice is overvalued. Possibly. But I think in this kind of market, um, you know, everyone thought that it was overvalued when Fox invested. Good point. Good point. So when you're, um, when you're looking at things that they're doing, mm -hmm. um, not just, I mean, for, they, they've connected with that audience because they have this sort of gonzo approach to journalism. Mm -hmm. They're this sort of new thing. Is, do they risk yeah, becoming I mean, I, the not, I, not the new thing as? Well, I think they're broader than people think. You know, I would also remind the room that they're a 20-year-old company that started out as a magazine. Right. And that is a pretty significant evolution. Um, and that takes commitment and intelligence and business savvy to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, th they were less interesting to us as a, a news organization um, but more interesting in the verticals that they have. They have, you know, munchy and um, the fashion and noisy. And if you look at their entire portfolio, just in that one company, they look like a little cable portfolio. Right. They do. <laughs> and um, and they're, they're getting it right. They're doing just good enough, you mm -hmm. know, to sort of continue to grow. And they're getting more and more sophisticated with their content production and their quality with each passing month. And the data that they have is very interesting. Also, the relationship that they have directly with clients, advertising clients. Right. You know, they've, they've, in a very sophisticated manner, sort of gone around the agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and that direct relationship is, is very powerful, and I think one that they're, we'd like to learn more from. Isn't that how they, most of their revenue is derived? Mm -hmm. those, yeah, those relationships. I mean, that's, yes. that's the, the wrap on them is that content-wise, it's, it's, you know, it's minuscule or small, 
a lot smaller than people think mm -hmm. on you know just a cursory examination, mm -hmm. but that where their where their power is is in yeah. The I mean, for me, the power is the international scope of them. Mm -hmm. You know, we are an international company and a global brand, and they are as well. Yeah. And I think brand. I mean, it keeps coming back to brand. Do you want to invest in someone that's buying traffic and aggregating views with no clear thread right. or do you want to buy something or invest in something that is a very clear proposition with it comes back to the first comment of the quality of the audience yeah. not the quantity I know who they're talking to they know who they're talking to and that's a I think in growth that's a, a better play than quantity alone so I mean that brings us to the, the relationship with the creative community I think you um, you mentioned all of these um, it, formerly independent production companies getting acquired by these big mm -hmm. conglomerates. When they so don't, I went out and acquired their executives. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't, and they don't even own their content. They don't no. own Pawn Stars. They don't own uh, Storage Wars. No. What Duck Duck Dynasty? Why? What? Why has that trend dissipated? Why did it start, and how has it affected you? Um, it hasn't really affected us. I mean, I, I think some of the creative drought that you see is because of the massive amount of distraction that's been going on in the unscripted community for the last couple of mm -hmm. years. I mean, I've been preaching to that community's, you know, less deal, more show, you know, and, and I don't know that it's been listened to, mm -hmm. quite honestly. You know, why these deals were done, you know, a lot of us still scratch our head. I, you know, you could assume it's cash flow right um, you know and and people sort of looking at their company and how do they grow their revenue lines and but that's gonna catch up because these earnouts are gonna come right and I don't know you need a long tail to sustain the business long term and we control the long tail right um, you know production companies are our lifeblood we we need them we need to be good partners with them I think the bigger challenge is who's who's next? Who's the next group of creatives? And you have that problem in the scripted side. You have it in LA. You have it in New York. You have it on the unscripted side. There's this small pool of people that everyone keeps going to for the same shows versus really taking that big swing on you know somebody that's unproven. Mm -hmm. And that's challenging when you're laying out tens of millions of dollars to invest in something. Yeah. Um, well, Not an easy thing to do. Well, and also, I mean, you mentioned the, the drought, the, the creativity drought in, in mm -hmm. Unscripted. I mean, is there, you know, Unscripted is so much the lifeblood of so many cable networks. Mm -hmm. Are we, are, is that drought ending? Where, where, where is the next I mean, big I think, hit coming you from? You know, we, we, look, when the writer's strike happened a long time ago, you know, scripted was really bottoming out. It, yeah. it got bad, and there was a, a a real sort of rush to unscripted, and there was some big numbers. That was back in the Dog, the Bounty Hunter days, and yeah. the Deadliest Catch, and people could see, wow, there's a really lucrative business there. And while everybody was over here rushing, we are a very bad industry at, okay, let's all go on this bandwagon now. <laughs> um, everybody sort of rushed to the unscripted, when that happens, you actually create an enormous amount of creative freedom over here in the scripted, because mm -hmm. no one's paying attention. And what do you have to lose? Take the big swing, because everybody wants to be over here versus over here, so I have to swing big, right. because what else am I going to do? And that's when you see the, the walking deads happen and the, you know, the true crimes happen. And now, as an industry, as we're known to do, everybody's running over here and looking for their version of a true crime and a walking dead. Right. And so, you know, I think my challenge is keeping the team focused on, you know, not regurgitating what we've already done, but where's the idea that everyone thinks is archaic, but we should do. And, and that's, that's the sort of fabric of what we do every day. And it's trying to find the right teams with the right chemistry that will, that will swing, swing big. And you know, I think it's much harder to manage a team that's had enormous success than it is to manage a team that's climbing its way up. Hmm. And that's probably our biggest challenge at A&E now, yeah. that you have these teams that just feel like there's so much to lose. 
And once a team starts feeling like there's a lot to lose, oh, you know, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the, I mean, most, most of the, all the networks have in-house studios. You guys have one. Mm -hmm. Is there, how, do you need creative tension to make that a success? I mean, it is by the very nature that it's in-house going to kind of, there's plenty of creative tension between them, let me trust me. <laughs> uh, you know, studio thinks it has the right to green light, the network thinks it has the right to, um, you know, I think that that's a necessity. The, the license model of I get 24 runs for one year on something that you're paying $3 million an hour for doesn't work. Yeah. And, um, you know, does it mean that we're, we're mandating that the, the brands can only work with the studio? No, but we were doing too much self generating of ideas and, and IP property and then going to studios and saying, will you do mm -hmm. this with us? And then giving up half the rights, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And I think you know, in this world where the long tail and all of these different platforms is gonna be important, we have to own the scripted yeah. or not do it. Yeah, and the unscripted? We've always owned We've that. We've always owned that, so it's, so, the you know, but it has less of a long tail. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the model, the rerun model in cable is is the most stressful, untalked about thing. <laughs> um, you know, we could get five, six runs out of an episode, and we're lucky to see two and a half now, and wow. that's over a twenty-four month period. And it, and when did that shift? About, I think, in the last like two years, it's been dramatic. Yeah. So you need. So you you have to populate your yeah, channels with three hundred plus scripted shows out there and all of cable. That's insane. I mean, yeah. we can all probably only name ten. Yeah. 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 On cable. Yeah. So um, the the big sort of overarching question for you now that you've been in in this job for a bit, what has been the uh, the biggest challenge, and what do you still feel like you need to get your arms around? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest, I'll, I'll answer that personally. I mean, the biggest challenge is that I'm seen in the building as the programmer. <laughs> and I, I can't call all the programming shots anymore. And so how do you, you know, there's almost like this, well, she did it mentality. And that they, you know, we have to get away from that in our own company. And, you know, we need to find people who have their own passion for our brands and, and their own point of view and let, the next generation of powerful creatives redefine our company. Mm -hmm. That's now somebody else's job. I'm a steward, and I'm responsible for it, and I'm responsible to the partners, and um, and I will guide and participate. But you know, how do you sort of? That's an awful lot of change inside an organization at once. You know, yeah. Abby and I have been partners for 15 years, and you know, I think our transition was textbook. Um, but it was a big transition, yeah. and I think l learning how to balance that is, you know, one of the big challenges we have. Also, in the face of so much business change, you yeah. know, so you know, it's just the what to focus on question. I think is something I struggle with every day. Should it be distribution? Should it be content? Should it be the person who's misbehaving on the 14th floor? Should it be the person, you know? And, and that's, a, that's a question that, you know, every day we sit down and, and what I'm doing is I have a sort of small kitchen cabinet, I like to call it, group of, of executives. You know, what's on everyone's radar? Are we marching towards the same purpose? Are we marching towards the same goal? And making sure everyone sort of stays on that path. Do you think, so you don't have any, any trouble letting go? You, I didn't uh, say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, it's yeah. hard, you know. When you come up through a company, you've done a lot of jobs. Yeah. So you know what, what, where to hide stuff. <laughs> 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 and so you are dealing with that person misbehaving. Yes, on yeah. I know that trick, I invented it. <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> I think the question about the cable TV bundle will be where does the ultimate penetration end up? It's not going away completely because the consumers have had the ability to vote on their choice for a long time already, and they are overwhelmingly sticking with the bundle. Doesn't mean that with all of these new products we won't see some change there, but is it 
is the bundle at 80% penetration or is it at 70% penetration or God forbid is it 50% penetration? I think that's the question that we're all wrestling with. Um, but it completely going away is not, I, I don't think is gonna happen. We're an incredibly um, attractive portfolio to, to distributors because of the value that we bring and the brands that we bring at the price point, the non-sports price point that we bring. Um, and also diversity of our audience. So I think making sure that we are in those smaller pr packages is m my number one priority. Um, you know, we have to be there. And I think it's, you know, I was having a conversation with Richard. It, it's interesting to be, I'm excited about being in a, th I shouldn't say this, a 30 channel universe and being sampled versus being in a 150 channel universe and trying to be sampled. There's an awful lot of waste in the current system. Um, but I also think on the OTT, as we talked about, I mentioned earlier, there's an opportunity for us to do things outside of our current brands. Um, you know, we have a catalog of over 11,000 hours of programming that we own. You know, I could imagine an OTT product for history enthusiasts that's, you know, thousands of hours of video around every war imaginable. We've got it. We've got, you know, all of that sort of unscripted programming around, you know, wars we didn't even know we had. And, um, and that could be a really robust, interesting product. So we're starting to look inward and go, look, we have assets that we're probably not reimagining because we don't, we haven't been conditioned to think that way. And so how do we, how do we start thinking like that? Well, we definitely not our <coughs> brands. We're not. We don't want to undo the bundle and take history out on its own. That's not what I said. But we do have hours, thousands of hours in our library where we could put together products that aren't directly connected to the big franchises that you see out there. And then, of course, the slings of the world. You know, we're we're there. Betty? Hi, Betty Cohen. Um, <coughs> there are some analysts who will say oh. that cable networks licensing their programming to the Amazons and Netflix of the world are inventing their competitors. And then there's the argument that you're probably making money uh, from licensing and getting exposure. Um, is there a, um, f f you know, where is your reflection point? between how much you should be uh, having your, your product showing up on the other OTT competitors and how much, you know, where does it s stop benefiting you and start hurting you? Um, I've been a lone voice of we should never have done this out there. Um, and it's less about competitor and more about we just cha trained a, an audience to not watch commercials. And we're all, with the exception of a handful of brands, 50% or more dependent on commercials. Um, and so that that's the bigger, the habit that was created. Um, this is probably one of the biggest arguments we have internally, you know, what to do. We haven't done big deals with with those um, platforms. We, I mean, they're relatively small. Um, we haven't wanted to, and whatever we've done has been very short term, so we can yank it back. But, you know, Unfortunately, the argument that I'm wrestling with with my own executives is that everybody else is doing it. Well, that doesn't make it right. Um, but, you know, do you take the money while it's there or not? And that's something that we're constantly wrestling with. On the studio side, they're going to need that relationship. Yeah. And so, you know, now we have a different point of view inside the company going, well, wait a minute, you know, look at the... Look at the economics of a scripted series when it's in its second season or third season versus just trying to make a go of it on a spots and dots business. And that's where it becomes pretty pretty interesting. Um, I do think that you can't fight disruption and you can't fight technology and you can't fight where the audience is. So we have to reimagine our business to make sure that our brands are where the audience is going. And it remains to be seen. I mean, there you everyone saw the 1.5 billion raise for content that Netflix is doing. I, I can't imagine they're going to keep wanting to buy all of our content when they're going to go out and produce their own content. They'll get more and more selective around that. Okay. Yep. Process.
Scott Singer. Um, what processes do you have in place to um, reimagine uh, your business and create that sort of business of innovation within your organization rather than be whipsawed by it out in the marketplace? On what front? The distribution, the creative, the, all of it? All of it. I mean, obviously, we're just talking about distribution, but um, how you connect with that consumer. You know, we, we don't own the relationship with the consumer, and that's one of the things that we're talking a lot about internally. You know, the distributor has the pipe into the house, and, and producers create the content that could go direct to the consumer as well. And so how do we get, you know, closer to that, that consumer? That's one of the, I think, the big discussion points um, at our company. You know, keeping teams moving, keeping, just getting an organization from, Denial to acceptance <laughs> is a big, I think, a big step. And you know, getting a management team to understand we don't know the end of the story, but if we don't turn the pages, we're really screwed, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm not, I don't feel like I'm answering your question, but if you know, we require them to keep trying new things and and fail fast when something doesn't work. Um, you sort of have to embrace the failures as they come, because they're going to come. But somewhere in one of those failures is going to be a big win that we didn't expect. And I think you know, we see that on the programming end of things, and I see it on the business end of things, too. Um, was 10% advice the right thing? I, you know, I don't know. I think so. But there's going to be other things as well, and some of those are going to work, and some of those are not. Um, but not doing is not an option. That makes sense. Hi, Joe Schramm. Um, given the impact that multiculturals are having on the uh, millennial demographic, um, what, uh, how do millennial audiences play a role in the future of a and &E networks? Um, you know, we attract them across our brands. We don't have a, a specific brand that is, I would say, just millennial-focused the way, let's say, an MTV possibly has one of, you know, you could say MTV is. Um, we look for it in programming. We look for it in diversity of programming. So if Lifetime is more female skewing, then what is that female voice that attracts the millennial um, demographic and the history is a little more male-focused? What is that voice? I think they're, you know, they're a generation that wants authenticity in a way that we've never seen before. <laughs> I mean, they, they very much like the strong individual points of view, and so we think about that and look at that in our storytelling. They want diversity in their casts. We have to get better at that. Um, you know, and, and I think you can't ignore you know, the, the cultural shifts in this country, and that's the very reason why you evolve brands in the first place because you're really a mirror back to the, the big generation that's coming up through, um, you know, through our culture. There's a, there's a narrative around second season being the new first season, uh, <laughs> because... That's called... <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I'm very interested with the never mind. So, but the, the question of consumers saying, well, I'll wait to make sure it's going to be around season two and I'll catch up season mm -hmm. one. And is there, is there a lot of discussions on the creative side about, uh, I'd be interested in designing content for commercials versus designing content without commercials, designing yeah. designing storytelling for breaks versus designing storytelling without breaks, and how do you guys, how do you guys convince them that they want to design for you? I, I, you know, I think nothing is off the table. I would start, I would start with that. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate in our business around is the second season the new first season is distribution you know are people going to watch commercials is what I say to my our company is what are you doing at home and when we ask that question you get that blank stare and everyone in the room like oh crap I'm doing that too well okay if we're all doing that at home then you can't deny what is coming I think unquestionably the quality of the creative has to be better on the commercial side too. We just did Sons of Liberty which was a big mini for history and had a really wonderfully executed sponsorship with Sam Adams of all things. It was tailor made. We didn't do the show for them <laughs> um, but it was a perfect sort of glove and hand fit. 
Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work with um, Roe v and trying to get more data around selling and, and more information around the quality of the audience that we're driving. We're doing a lot of tests where, you know, cross-platform selling, not just our platform, but, you know, while Sons of Liberty is airing in the home on all of the different devices, the same sponsors can be delivered. Um, you know, all of that's in its infancy. The challenge there is scale. You know, we're a business that's used to being able to, you know, drive scale pretty quickly, and this is going to get a lot more one-to-one. -one. And so how do we evolve our organization to deal with the one-to-one? Um, but I think creative, look, the, the longest, um, so what is the duration of the most popular spot on YouTube? So YouTube ranks commercials. So does anyone know? It's two minutes. So this generation just sees content as content. They, it's, you know, they are actually marketed to. I think it's a misnomer that we're saying they don't accept marketing when they're watching two-minute commercials on YouTube. Um, it just has to be a good commercial, a really, and it has to be content. It has to tell a story, and we have to get back to that. Shock for shock isn't going to work. It has to be a great story. Um, yeah, Sorry. hi. Uh, my name's Kate. I, um, I was curious about your programming for young millennial women in particular, because the... You know, Lifetime, I think, is a brand that is known among young people as being for older, an older audience. And you've just bought into Vice, which is a platform that's predominantly for, for men and boys. So um, My and, son better not be watching Vice. <laughs> well, Hearst, Hearst has always been such a great place for women audiences, whether it's the magazines or Lifetime. But I think that there's a little bit of a disconnect. I, I teach at Sarah Lawrence, and I know from my students that, you know, when Orange is the New Black came out, that was, like, the biggest thing ever. It was, you know, for that young female audience. Scandal is also uh, another big, big hit for them. They love to see diversity. They love to see, you know, younger people. Is there something in the portfolio well, think, or is there a I way to we like have more of it than you change realize. the brand you know and the brand is absolutely through an evolution going through an evolution the lifetime coming into the AE network portfolio only happened four years ago um, and you know it it's a real makeover story so to speak and I remember the defining moment and Betty's shaking her head and knows this story and knows the challenges with lifetime but you know having to present to the board what is the number one show for women in America? And you know, the what not to wear was like, no, Walking Dead. And that redefines, and, and you have to sort of pivot, you know, who, who is calling the shots for what women want to watch. Um, you know, our average age of lifetime, we've seen the highest ranking in 18 to 49 women on lifetime than we've seen in the last 12 years. Um, so we're making big progress. Dance Moms and Bring It average age is, is 26. That's unheard of. You know, we're seeing movies. The um, Saved by the Bell reunion was like 33 years old. I mean, the, I think we're making those, those strides. What we're actually seeing is a little bit the, um, I call it the Judy Bloom Forever thing, that you're not supposed to read it, but you do. Um, that there are young girls seeking out Lifetime and and watching things that may questionable whether they should be watching them. But I love that because they're making it their own. They're putting their own stamp on it. And, and we're getting that sort of social reverb from them of what they like and what they don't like. So it's, it's easy to point at things when they've been a big hit and say, why aren't you doing that? You know, I would like to do the orange is the new black. Let's not, let's be clear. But you know, what we have to do is find our own next hit. We have a show coming up this summer, Unreal which is a huge swing, and I, I think it's going to be great. I love it. It's a big risk for Lifetime. Um, it takes place on the set of a fictitious dating show where they give out roses, um, and it's a, it's a sort of a mixture of reality and then the scripted drama embedded. So you're following the, the track of the who's going to win, but it's also the drama that ensues sort of around 
the definition of love and why we put ourselves in these situations. So I think things like that aren't something that you would have seen on Lifetime a while ago. Army Wives was our number one show, and we said goodbye to it when it was our number one show because we were trying to make a statement to that new audience, you know, come here, we are for you too. For financial reasons, we said goodbye too, but, um, you know, those are, those are hard decisions to make, and you do them to talk to that next generation of viewer. Uh-oh. Oh, this would be a good one. Uh, it's Rich Greenfield. So, you know, you, you brought up the topic of, uh, of Netflix investing in content. So Netflix is probably going to invest three, four billion dollars in content this year. I think Amazon just came out and said they're going to do a billion three. Hear that, Frank? <laughs> uh, a billion three. Um, so these big tech companies clearly see the value and the importance of getting into content. Conversely, you're a big content company. You make some of the world's most well-known content. How seriously are you thinking about investing in technology? You know, when you look at what those companies have in terms of their tech, what do you need to do in tech to compete? You know, I, th I think tech is something that we can, you know, buy, partner, and license. You know, building an organization that has thousands of engineers, I just don't see in our future. Um, I think we have to be open to making sure that we are, um, you know, partnering with the right organizations that can provide that tech backbone to us. You know, it, we aren't going to be a distribution company and we aren't going to be a technology company or a hardware company, at least in the foreseeable future. You know, who knows what we'll be in 10 years. But, you know, where are those relationships that intersect with um, the platforms that we want to be on, the data that we want to obtain, and where's the mutual mutually beneficial relationship where we've got the brands, the megaphone, and the content for those companies and vice versa. You know that there's lots of things that we'd like to see our industry doing, but we also have very complicated long-term and important distribution deals. And, you know, as consumers, we know what, what is happening and what, what we want to see, but there are real business logistics that have to be overcome in order to do that. Does that make? Yeah, I mean, the challenge is getting data, right? <coughs> right now, like if, if I use an A&E app or an A&E on a Roku, how much do you know about me or Joe or whoever else in the audience? Or we don't know audience? your demographic profile. Do you know my name? No. Comcast. Okay. If you come to us, I know your name. But if you go to, if you go to Comcast, I don't. If you've registered, you know, it's, it's hard. Means it's we hard. Can keep watching yeah. <laughs> no, no, the Lifetime movies that we're watching late at night for our Fifty Shades of Grey fix. We can keep doing that. This is on tape somewhere. Do we have time for one more question? One more. Yeah. Hi, this is Bryce Hall. You mentioned the, the need to continually refresh and evolve a number of the, the brands and channels. You specifically mentioned Lifetime and history. And so I'm curious when you're guiding that evolution, how you push that innovation and creativity uh, while also preserving with many of these legacy brands that are so um, sort of beloved that people have a very specific idea of what it is to be the History Channel or Lifetime and yeah. sort of pushing that innovation while protecting that. I think it's probably the most common question I get, you know, how do you know you don't? And um, I think that acknowledging that is the first step. Um, you know, rewarding. I would rather fail spectacularly than fail mildly because it means you tried and you took the big swing. I think you have to listen to the audience, you know, and we have more ways to listen to the audience than ever before. Um, I think with history, you know, we took a lot of heat for what was going on, you know, and what were we doing, but the audience kept telling us every day, we have this magical report card that comes every day, I like this, I like this, and, and as long as, a, as an executive team and as a programming team, what we drove home every single day for two years was how is this history? Maybe we were stretching, but the very fact that we were asking the question every day and we had to answer it back kept the dialogue going. And I think you can't ever have a creative team afraid to ask a question or afraid to question the strategy or the creative decisions going on. As long as you have that culture that feels like they can say, 
you know, this show sucks. Are we kidding ourselves? You know, and you have to foster that. You have to foster the voices that people don't necessarily want to listen to, but should. Um, and I think, you know, we, culture is something that we work on every day. It's, it's you can't take it for granted. Um, you know, it's something we analyze and discuss and beat to death. <laughs> Um, how do you keep it going? And, um, and it's hard in this kind of landscape when there's a lot of fear. That's what I worry about. That's probably what I lose the most sleep over. You know, with this mentality of fear that's out there, how do you keep your team swinging for the fences? And I'm a big believer in go for the grand slam and swing for the fences because you're going to end up with some doubles. But if you're just swinging for doubles, you're never going to get the grand slam. Thank you.